It's a Minefield is a weekly audio program where we talk getting the most out of life with mental health challenges with fun and love to be enjoyed by the whole community. On It's a Minefield, we speak with well-known and not so well-known Australians about the issues that affect us as we live with these challenges. It's the mad leading the mad. <laughs> We're pretty in sync with each other. <laughs> Drugs destroy lives. Or do they? When I was a kid, I remember being told to say no to drugs. It was on telly a lot. We're told that some drugs are evil, like ice and heroin. However, in the 1600s, the demon drug was tobacco. In fact, Pope Urban VIII issued a worldwide ban on smoking based on the logic that tobacco use makes people sneeze which too closely resembles sexual ecstasy. For some people living with mental health issues, the impacts of drug use can be devastating and even fatal. However, for some, intoxication can also be a source of joy, inspiration and self-knowledge. My next guest knows a lot about drugs. Professor Nadine Ezard is the director of the National Centre for Clinical Research on Emerging Drugs, as well as being the clinical director of the Alcohol and Drug Service at St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney. Nadine has had over 25 years experience in the addiction medicine field and is considered one of Australia's experts. After gaining her medical qualifications from the University of Melbourne, she acquired her Masters of Public Health from Harvard and her PhD in public health from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She has previously worked for the World Health Organization, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, and the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime. Nadine, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Leon. It's great to be here. <laughs> You've dedicated your career to working with alcohol and other drug use. Where did that interest come from? As a human, actually, primarily. When I studied medicine, I initially thought I'd do epidemiology, public health, and then I had a friend that was working in drugs and alcohol, yeah. and his job sounded so interesting. And he said to me, the privilege of hearing people's stories yeah. is the thing that really excites me. And, and that's true. That, so that's more than 25 years ago I decided to go into this area, and it's true. Every day I feel that same privilege of hearing people's stories. And it covers, this area of medicine covers everything that I like, so social health, public health, medical health, mental health. And also I, I live in the world and, and come across people in my daily lives that are using drugs in various different ways to enhance their lives or even have problems with their lives. And so perhaps many people in Australia, I have also people in my family that are touched by substance use disorders in, in a more severe way as well. So I yeah. work across that spectrum of, I think you said joy, <laughs> through to despair. What an incredibly refreshing answer. Why do people use recreational drugs? Great question. But can I say, take the second part before the first part? I myself have a bit of a problem with the term recreational drugs because I don't really know what that means. We use a lot of drugs or substances in our lives. Some of them are prescribed, some of them are legal, some of them are illegal, some of them are quasi-legal. And some of the drugs that we might call recreational, people use for occupational reasons. So for, I'm thinking particularly like methamphetamine that can keep people awake when they're working shift work and they wouldn't see anything recreational about that. It's work-related yet it would be kind of classified as recreational use because maybe they're not running into problems with that. They just see it as very utilitarian. So if you focus on why do people use drugs for recreation, you've already answered the question, why do people use drugs for fun? <laughs> because they use drugs for fun. And when you look at something like the National Drug Strategy Household Survey, where the government asks a representative sample of people around Australia, why do they use drugs? Most people say for fun, for enjoyment, for curiosity. And there are a few people that we know, and we all probably know in our, our social worlds too, that use because they're kind of stuck using them. If they don't use them, they feel pretty awful and they, they feel out of control with their use. But most people aren't in that category. Most people are using for other reasons. Do you think some drugs are more problematic than others? I, I do think different drugs carry with them different problems or risks associated with them and mm. for different people. So for some people, yep. they might be particularly 
at risk of certain harms associated with some drugs. But when you look at a population perspective, I think tobacco was the drug that caused the most harm in Australia for a long time. And in the yeah. 70s, around 50% of the adults smoked at that time. And it really was responsible for a lot of heart disease and lung disease in the country. So that's a big problem. So is that a problem drug or is it the way that we use it? And there have been efforts to, to rank which drugs are more yep. problematic over other drugs. And in the end, the way it's ranked is usually by asking a bunch of experts what they think is more problematic and what isn't. So, yeah, what do what are what are experts saying? Is there a general consensus? So experts really think opioids and alcohol are pretty harmful. Okay. And opioids are interesting because we know that opioids, so when I say opioids, I mean drugs that are related to the opium poppy. Yep. So drugs that come from the opium poppy are called opiates and drugs that are similar to that are called opioids and they act on the opiate receptor in the brain. Yep. And they're a really useful class of drugs. Yeah. They work for pain relief particularly and without them, we can't manage pain very well. Some of our strongest painkillers are, are opioid drugs. So they have a genuine purpose. And then some people might run into problems with, dependence on the drug yeah. and then when they don't have it they feel really sick yeah so when you when you throw all those drugs in together and say that's the most dangerous drug i think you've got to tease out what you're talking about for whom what drug in what setting so if people are injecting they might be exposed to some of the other harms that are associated with injecting drug use particularly if they're in countries where you can't get clean needles and syringes readily so yeah. you have risk of hiv transmission hepatitis c transmission and just it's, it's the, the drug, the context, the way people use it and the route of administration that will all contribute to harms associated with the drug. But have, ranking one drug over another is, is a difficult exercise, I think. It is a difficult exercise and probably a futile exercise because that answer could change in different societies at different times for different reasons and to different people too, you know? And I think right now in Australia, alcohol is still our biggest drug problem and we still don't really talk about it like a drug problem. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to disclose I've, uh, uh, I've used a lot of drugs. The one drug that, that was the most difficult for me to control and stop was alcohol. Mm. Why is that? What, what do you think that's about? Do you, well, my, my question to you is, do you, do you think there's something inherent in that drug that is different to any other drug? Or is it just about your particular relationship to a drug that is less stigmatised potentially in many settings in Australia? In Australia, in other contexts, alcohol is more stigmatised than some of the drugs in Australia we think totally. are bad. Um, but certainly more readily available and possibly cheaper. I mean, alcohol is the cheapest it's ever been in Australia at the moment. It's about 20 cents mm. a standard drink. So it's pretty mm. cheap, available, triggers everywhere for its use. So mm. is it about the drug itself in a physiological or chemical sense or is it more about mm. the kind of context in which it's available and used? Alcohol is certainly available. It's very psychoactive and heaps of people take it. Alcohol, you can get delivered to your front door. You don't even have to leave the house. So I'm going to give you a few statements that mm -hmm. are commonly held beliefs, and I'd like to know what your response to them are. Number one, once an addict, always an addict. That's a great question, and it's certainly, it is certainly one of our sycophantic beliefs. Yeah. Um, I, I, again, I don't even know what that question means. Um, yep. it's, it's certainly drug dependence and substance use disorders are incredibly stigmatised. Yeah. It's uh, that once an addict, always an addict is kind of up there with never trust a junkie. It's yeah. that whole kind of stigma around compulsion to use and prioritisation of, of drug use over everything else. And I, I don't actually believe that it's true. People change. People do change. We know people change. The other thing is the other kind of myth that goes along with that is this idea of the addictive personality that people fl flip between one substance and another but they've just got something inside them that makes them addicted to stuff and sure there are kind of personality traits that maybe risk seeking thrill seeking pleasure seeking or more likely in my context where I work with people in a clinical setting histories of trauma so there is deep distress and that it's looking for ways to ease that deep distress, particularly trauma in early childhood, particularly multiple trauma. I used to believe in the idea of addictive personality, which therefore meant any attempt to try and change my drug and alcohol use would be useless because it's innate to my personality. Well, and it also, and it also pathologizes it. I mean, people do get some benefit out of 
using drugs, even if it is in this in a, a way to deal with with feelings that are hard to cope with. And we do prescribe drugs for that reason in medicine, in, particularly in mental yeah, health. Totally. And so pathologizing it because people are trying to take control themselves by prescribing themselves yeah. is not, I don't think, a useful way forward to recovery or to well-being. Okay, I've got a I've got a doozy. You must hit rock bottom before you can get better. Ah, uh, yeah, I love this one too. Um, I I, th- I personally find that a very cruel way to shape people's experience that yeah. that there is an idea that suffering is somehow redemptive, that it, feeling extremes of despair will somehow get you somewhere else, or that there is a bottom limit that there is something objective and measurable that you can get to and then you'll get somewhere else. I, I, I don't understand the benefit of that kind of phrase. It's much better to turn things around and validate people's experience of the kind of not so good things of the way that they're using yep. drugs and think about how life could be different with a different relationship to the drug rather than thinking yeah. about the depths of despair that you've got to get to before you can get anywhere else. Yeah. And I mean, the, to be really blunt about it, the there is a rock bottom and it's the morgue. You know, that's where I see a real danger in that sort of belief, you know. What's the relationship between drug use and mental health? Oh, there's drug use and mental health and drug use and mental illness. There, there are bi-directional relationships, obviously. And, I mean, interestingly, if you look, I think it was the Gay Community Periodic Survey where they interviewed people about their drug use and their mental health. And yep. if you exclude people with substance use disorders, so people that are experiencing some distress from using using drugs or being, feeling out of control with their drug use. The group that were using occasionally actually had better mel- mental health than the people that weren't. Really? Self-reported mental health. So I, I'm not saying that that's the key to mental health, but it's all drug use doesn't necessarily have a negative impact on your mental health. People with mental illnesses might, I mean, some mental illnesses might find that some drugs are particularly negative for their experiences. And so I'm thinking people who might have a psychotic disorder and then use drugs that are known to be pro-psychotic like the stimulants or like cannabis then that it might make the mental illness worse or might mean they need to take more antipsychotic medication i think the 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 big one that most people around australia would have probably quite a lot of familiarity with is is depression and alcohol use so they yeah. that is has a very bi-directional relationship so people are depressed drink more people drink more and more depressed and yeah. so that's that's the relationship between mental illness and drug use but yeah. at the same time some people with with diagnosed mental illness will say they really do need their regular cannabis or regular yeah. some other drug to help them with their mental health so it's a really individual experience as well yeah and you wonder about the place of occasional party drugs with party social settings and how people report how exciting that is for their mental health and how it is a boost for their mental health mm. and well-being and the place of drug use in that as well. So it's there's a lot of different aspects to, to that relationship between mental health, mental illness, mental well-being, yeah. and some very substance use. Is there a line in the sand? How do you know when drug use is problematic for yourself? Yeah, that's that's a really great, really great question. And that's 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 the kind of um, red flags that you need to be looking out for yourself. So the the kind of mental and physical checkups and identifying where there's a relationship to your drug with your drug use for that is is something that we spend quite a lot of time working on so for example with methamphetamine actually we've just developed an app to help people exactly to ask that question for people using methamphetamine how do you know when yeah i mean methamphetamine itself as a drug yep. has cardiovascular consequences can cause a whole range of you know strokes in people so it, it does have effects as, as a drug but to answer, ask that question about yep. when does my methamphetamine use might be a problem we developed an app to help people kind of track how much they're using and whether they're having physical or mental health problems associated with that use because it is hard to tell when you're inside it it is really hard to tell and and sometimes a check is your friends yeah yeah so if your friends are saying hey are you sure you you seem a bit not yourself that's kind of a good flag and the other thing is i think the sense of compulsion the sense of loss of control so if for example if you've got a job that is monday to friday and then you're using whatever substance you, you'd like to use on the weekend and then you notice you're using it on the Mondays and the Tuesdays. Yeah. 
or you can't go to work on Monday and Tuesday because you're recovering from whatever happened on the weekend. They're kind of yeah. external red flags that you can keep an eye on. By the time you've lost your job, that's a big red flag. Yeah, yeah. Um, or relationships, lots of arguments within your relationship, then check back and see if there's any relationship to your drug use or coming down yeah. from your drug use, recovering from it, being intoxicated. Yeah. And then your physical health checkup. Yeah. Going so, to your friendly GP and saying, I'm doing this, can you just give me some feedback about whether it's having any effect on me yet? Yeah. How do you think we can be better allies for drug users? I think, look, the, the biggest, biggest thing is to take away the stigma and the judgment. So often I think we have a, a very inconsistent approach to the various drugs in Australia. So yeah. legal drugs and illegal drugs seem to be classified differently. And then within the illegal drugs, there are some that are somehow more stigmatised than others. Yeah. And the way we talk about it in the media, talk about it in the press, talk about people that use those drugs really influences how people then feel when yeah. they're using those drugs. And I think that we need to take that away and take away the shame and stigma and help people and help families and friends of people who are running into problems with, with drug use to talk about it openly without some sort of shame or some implication that they're doing wrong or bad. Well, why do you think the stigma's there? Because that's a really common thing, but for some people there's a real morality attached to drug use. What's that about? The, the, there's so many different parts of that question, Leon. <laughs> there are a whole range of different moral frameworks that people are working from within when they talk about yeah. drug use and talk about I mean, some of the moral frameworks consider drugs alienating the body that you were born with and that you need to be the closest that you were yeah. when you were born. The body is a temple. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and other people consider that, that the pursuit of pleasure is somehow tainted, that that's not uh, morally acceptable to, to, yeah. to pursue pleasure. And for others, it's seen as a moral weakness that if you yeah. need drugs to cope with this world, then there's something weak in you that you are displaying to the world and that you should be somehow hiding that in the world. Yeah. So it does depend on your moral framework. Don't you think? I mean, what in your experience, what what <laughs> what makes people judge you? If you if you using drugs, why would you feel shamed or for me, there's a sense of I brought it upon myself. If I screw up or, or something bad happens, that was my choice. I, put, I, I brought that upon myself. And it's, so, it is, it's something quite deep-seated, isn't it? it it's quite, I, I, I mean, drugs are naughty. You, you know, if you want to piss your parents off, I remember being told the worst thing you can be is a poofter and worse than that is a junkie. <laughs> They're the worst things you can be, you know. <laughs> um, I've got a really hard question. I don't quite know the answer myself. If you could wave a magic wand, how would the world be to be a better place for drug users or intoxication? What could change? What should change in your mind? Uh, I think the easy one is to decriminalise drugs. I mean, I, I, I yeah. see so many people who harms they're experiencing related to their drug use is are, are multiplied because they're engaged with the criminal justice system or having jail sentences or, and the, the kind of additional harms that criminalising drug use adds to drug use. Like it, it's hard for me as a practitioner really to understand why we are where we are still with that. And this is talking me personally, not as any of the yeah. institutions I'm associated with, but I do, I do think that yeah, that's the easy magic wand because yep. it's it's even possible in our lifetime, I think. Yeah. Um, Nadine, thank you so much for joining me. I knew you'd be a fun and an interesting interview. <laughs> so thank you so much. Welcome to Club Mind. This is a segment where we ask three people their responses to the interview they've just heard by Nadine Ezard. Uh, today we've got Roy, Bill, and our friend Kaz, who you know. Can I get you to introduce yourselves and where you're calling from? I'm Leon from Gadigal country of the Eora Nation. I'm Bill. I'm in Padstay, but I belong to the Gamilaroi and Nguyen Nation. Hey, Kaz here uh, on Gadigal land of the Eora Nation. 
I'm Roy, and uh, calling from Adelaide, the Garden Country. Thank you for joining Club Mind. Now, the first question I have is, what do you think about Nadine's approach? I do think it's refreshing, and I love her outlook in terms of looking much deeper and, and opening the mind to what is drugs and, you know, like the relationship between mental health and, and AOD. No, I really liked it a lot. Um, and I think, you know, like uh, with the um, shift in positive pathways for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, we have a, a lot to learn from this, you know. Yeah, uh, I, I, mate, very much of the same opinion as you. Her ideas are, are very refreshing. There was a question that was once asked of me. It was, who would you like to be operated on if you had a choice between an alcoholic and a heroin user. And um, I, I was a bit naive. I said, well, both I don't think I'd like to be operated on. But the truth of the answer is, if you give an alcoholic a drink, their nerves are steady. And if you give a heroin addict a shot, it's the same thing. Both nerves are steady. They're calm, collected. I like her thinking because it's um, it's very open-minded and there's nothing holding her back from saying what she needs to say. And there's so much research going on now with marijuana, with MDMA, with ketamine that now have therapeutic benefits that outweigh certain medications. And my personal drug of choice that I that I had a substance use issue with was alcohol, which I found had zero therapeutic benefits, but was so accepted by society, still is accepted. People still question me to this day. Do you, did you really have an alcohol use disorder or did you just drink a little bit more than you thought you should? So it's like, I, I feel like alcohol is the only drug that you know that you can that you can be addicted to and have a substance use disorder and still people are like, nah, it's so socially accepted. You're fine. You're fine. It's the, it's the only drug you have to explain why you're not taking. And I'd love society to change their mind about that because, oh, alcohol really ruined me. And I ended up in emergency with stabbing liver pains, vitamin B deficiency, my whole life in shreds. And still people saying, you know what, you, you sure you don't want to have a drink? It's so much fun. We, and people saying, we miss you being drunk. I I mean, as, as I said in the interview, I, I agree. Alcohol uh, was the biggest problem for me and yet I'm thinking what would Nadine say and maybe Nadine would say alcohol does have a purpose in something like celebration in socializing so maybe alcohol is not only bad but it's your relationship with alcohol is bad like mine is <laughs> mine was um, so I mean I was interested that when I said to Nadine, uh, what's the relationship between drugs and, and mental health? She said, okay, the relationship between drugs and mental health and described the positive relationships on drugs on mental health and then the relationships on mental illness uh, very wisely. So sh she listed a number of benefits of illicit slash recreational drugs. What did you think about that? Yeah, look, I, I'm just thinking about, you know, like when I'm at home, we all get together up in Cairns, far north Queensland. It's not unusual to go through seven cartons of beer in one night. And, you know, like obviously we stay awake until 12 the next day. But, I mean, I'm 44 years old, so I can only have a six-pack these days. But, you know, like to put it in perspective, Alice Springs has the biggest renal failure unit in the country. Um, yeah, I mean, we relate it so much to having a laugh, having a yarn, you know, from where I'm from. Um, we do become concerned when a family member does, you know, look at recreational, using other harder drugs, you know, like it does become very concerning. So it, it is it is very much accepted. And yeah, I'm not sure if that answers your question. This is something that I was, was thinking of. Well, I, I think you did answer my question because what you said, I think what I heard was that alcohol has a positive use. It's, it causes socialising, it causes community, and in weighing the risks for you 
presently, maybe it's kind of worth it. And maybe that's not a problem. Yes, that's true. I mean, and, and, you know, like it sounds like a lot of alcohol, but I mean, it's, it's in, you know, hindsight. So a lot of fun memories and um, we still keep our culture close to our heart, but, you know, I'm talking about a great football players who, who, you know, the following day may go out there and play the best games of their lives, but it's good just to be yeah, connect on that level. Yeah. Mm. Mm. What do you reckon, Bill? Oh, I think it does have its place. Uh, I think we've all had experiences with alcohol where it may not have been a wise choice at the time, but, you know, when it comes to social settings, for relaxation, that sort of thing, to have one or two bourbons, um, that's that's all well and, well and good. And... Um, I think as long as you realise your limitations and your situation, I think it's a, a reasonable sort of piece of enjoyment, shall I say. But then on the other hand, if you're in a closed environment with someone that doesn't handle their uh, alcohol well, and especially in domestic situations, then, you know, maybe it's it's something that you stay away from for a certain amount of time. Or if you go in different directions, say you've gone on a, a weekend away with the boys and, you know, in, in that sort of casual private setting, then it's all, it's all right, you know. And it's a similar sort of thing with um, with the drugs as well. It, I think it depends on the situation. It depends on where you are. Me, I've never been someone that had been attached to any harder drugs or anything like that. I think um, pot was about the only thing that, that I really uh, had any interest in because that was a natural thing. I need to ask you what George W. Bush was asked. Did you inhale? Oh, my Lord, yes. Uh, <laughs> my, my thing was I, I never, ever um, enjoyed a joint. But when it came to having a, a billy or two, and everyone will know what I'm talking about there, um, that was my uh, poison of choice, shall I say, yeah. I did bucket bongs when I was in uh, university. Real highbrow stuff. Yeah. <laughs> that crack me too. <laughs> <laughs> so what was interesting, um, she said that people use drugs to change their emotional state. And sometimes we say, you know, it, it's not uh, helpful to take drugs to avoid emotions or to, to change an emotional state. But then said, well, we take psych drugs to avoid emotions and change our emotional state. What did you think of that? Yeah, I, I, was, I was reminded, you know, these studies um, have been going since the 1940s. And, you know, like recently they're looking into using drugs as a, a way of getting deeper, quicker results with it in terms of uh, therapy, you know. So it, it brings that person back you know, and, and makes things of clarity. I think it's 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 a good thing, you know. Um, yes. Mm. I'm intrigued by, yeah, uh, you know, we had lots of uh, scientific research on hallucinogens in the 60s and 70s that was kiboshed by Richard Nixon. And as I said, there's a lot of morality attached to drugs. One, uh, one uh, vignette I didn't share was that the first drug that was punishable by a death sentence was in the Ottoman Empire, now Turkey, in the 1600s. And if you were caught drinking coffee, you could be flogged publicly. If you were caught drinking coffee again, you could be sewn into a leather bag and thrown into a river. So coffee was the demon drug. Now, why do you think different times there's different drugs that are demonized? I'm going to suggest in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, heroin was a demon drug. Now it's ice. Why do you reckon that is? It feels so arbitrary and political. 
And I envision a society 50 years from now where we frown upon psychiatric medication because it'll be the least effective way of treating mental illness. And then you think about the prohibition era and there's all these times in history where random drugs are demonised and other drugs are considered okay and it, it, it doesn't make any sense. And I tackle with this all the time because I take my psychiatric medication every day but don't take any other drugs, free of alcohol. And I just think, why? Like, why did I decide that taking my psychiatric medication was okay and other drugs not? Is it because it's sold to me so it's legal? Because I don't really care about what's legal and what's illegal if it's not hurting anyone. So it's not, it's not a moral question. I have really no idea. I'd, I'd just like to say, you know, to quote Dr. Goblamate, in saying one cannot see through an inverted lens. And I've never had a beer thinking that, wow, I'm depressed. Um, I'm going to have a beer or a, a joint. I've always had something, well, not now, this is the younger days, but, you know, in that frame of mind, but because it, we're in the moment and we're all having fun and, and that's what we did. We're celebrating or, um, yeah, it was never, I don't think, you know, people don't know that, well, just to put it plainly, you know, we you don't know that, Sometimes uh, something's wrong. It may be greatly obvious to everybody else, but you know, as far as I'm concerned, I'm great, and I'm, <laughs> I feel like Superman. <laughs> you know, but to somebody else, they go, "Oh, that guy's struggling." But no, yeah, it's a very interesting, yeah, yeah. I guess, and, and that's why uh, she described to create your own line in the sand, because you just said that you drink beer for celebration, not to avoid depression. My uh, observation based on what Nadine said, I guess again is, is that a problem? No, that's, that, that's, that's right. Oh, I'm, I'm the same as you, um, Kaz. I take my medication, but I, I, I know it stabilizes me. I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm drug free, alcohol free. But I know I've got to take my medication, so that's that's great. But, yeah, I think it's a personal choice where you draw the line in the sand, but if you can see that something is causing you a problem, then I think, one, you might need to go and speak to someone or have someone in community to talk to, and then maybe it's a case of well, that's doing something to me that I don't like. I need to pull away from that because even when you're prescribed medication and I'm thinking along the lines of Largactyl now, that's something that really alters your state of mind and body and you act in a way that's not really natural for you. And that's the, um, that's the thing I pull from this, I guess, is that there's medications that are prescribed for you that are a lot worse than something that's natural or something that can have you in a state where you can operate, you can, you can do things. And I'm all for that. But when you come to, because I've sat in a, in a room where I've had a young bloke with uh, some psychological issues and he was dosed up with glargactyl to the max and everyone's talking around him, talking by him. And I said, you know, he can understand everything you're saying he can hear everything you're saying. Why are you not addressing him? And, um, yeah, I guess that's my standpoint on it. Uh, it's just to be aware of where, where you are and what situation you're in. Yes, absolutely. I've got one final question. Yes or no? Decriminalisation of drugs. What do you reckon? Yes. 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 Yeah, 
And I definitely think that what goes into illicit drugs is the biggest issue of how they impact people's lives and mental health. If if there was a like if you if you knew what was going into the illicit substances, it was all around the same dosing, all of that. So you knew exactly what you were taking when you took it. So many of the issues would subside with that. I strongly agree with that statement. The most vulnerable people, yes, if it was legalized, you know, um, the knowledge of what people will do to get drugs would be, would yeah, it would take that and make it a safer place. Yeah. And out of interest, did you have the same opinion an hour ago? Um, yeah, I, I did actually. I think it's about time that we decriminalised to take the negative and underworld issues out of drugs. Excellent. Thanks, considered feedback about that interview. Um, so thanks so much. Thanks for joining Club Mind. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure, mate. If you'd like to talk to someone about your own drug or alcohol use, call the Drug Info and Advice Line on 1300 8585 Or if you're concerned about a loved one, call Family Drug Support on 1300 368 186. That was Club Mind, hosted by me, Leon Fernandez, with panellists Bill Roy and Kaz, reflecting on the interview with Professor Nadine Ezard. See you next time. Everyone has an opinion about drugs, usually a strong one. For many parents, the thought of their children using illicit drugs is terrifying, and therefore, politicians who are tough on drugs can be appealing. My guest today has some very strong opinions about drugs. Tony Trimmingham lost his son, Damien, 24 years ago to a heroin overdose. Since then, he's been busy. Tony started an organisation called Family Drug Support. He's been a counsellor and group leader for over 30 years and has assisted many families who suffer the impact of alcohol and other drugs. In 1998, Prime Minister John Howard made him a founding member of the Australian National Council of Drugs, the principal advisory body to the federal government. In 2005, Tony was honoured with an Order of Australia medal for his work in the community. Unsurprisingly, he's been a very vocal activist around issues relating to drugs. However, his position might not be the one that you'd expect. Tony, thanks for joining me. You're welcome, Leon. Firstly, tell me about Damien. Okay, well, Damien was my son. as a young man growing up. Uh, he had a lot of friends. He was very active in sport. He was a state champion athlete and a representative footballer. Right. He was interested in music, the theatre. Uh, and as I said, he had literally hundreds of friends. Yeah. For instance, at his funeral, there was about 400 people came mm. from different activities that he was involved in. Um, he, I wouldn't want to paint him as a goody two-shoes yep. because he also got himself into... You know, a bit of trouble when he was a teen, teenager. Mm -hmm. He got involved in graffiti at one time. Um, but but generally, he was well-liked. He was mm -hmm. well-liked by not only his friends, but also his friends' parents mm -hmm. and his teachers. Mm -hmm. So he was doing well. He was, I think, headed to be a leader in some fields. I understand he was into the Greek god Dionysus. Oh, he was. Yeah. And even more than an interest, maybe an obsession with it which is interesting. It's very interesting. Dionysus is the god of fertility and growth, but also of wine and mirth and a bit of hedonism as well. Exactly. Yeah. Tell me what happened with Damien. Well, um, as I said, growing up, I think he was a, a bit of a risk taker. He was into a lot of things. Um, he, had a, he had a soft spot for the underdog. He looked after kids at school who were bullied and kids who didn't fit in, as well as the popular crowd. He, he was definitely one of the popular kids. Mm. 
it sounds like the way you were describing it, he had a interest in social justice, in connection, in curiosity, in adventure too. And these are um these are really cool attributes. Yeah. So then things didn't go so well. What happened next? It was 1996 that I realized there was a reasonably serious problem. He was 21 at the time. Yep. He just basically said, the shit's hit the fan, Dad, I'm on heroin. Mm. And I just got this almighty shock, you know, like it was the last thing I expected. Mm. And then when he told me the impact he had had, how much money he'd spent, yeah. uh, and the fact that he owed a lot of people money and that he'd stopped paying his bills and he'd sold all his stuff, that was a real shock. And I, I went through the emotions that I've subsequently discovered that most families go through. Yep. Uh, the three main ones being fear, guilt, and grief. Yeah. But what I expressed that morning was anger, yep. which again is fairly common that we use anger, which is the masking emotion, yeah. often to cover up those others. And I told him what I thought of him. And then I just kind of, it all hit me and I just sat down in the chair and I couldn't move. Yeah. After a little while, I got up, I grabbed him by the collar and I said, we're going to beat this. And I spent the next few days trying to get help, trying to get support. And that was when I realized something else. And that was that there wasn't much support. Yes. Particularly the families. Yep. There was a complete lack of empathy, I thought. Yep. Um, so I just kind of locked that away. Um, but it didn't help me at the time. Yeah. So there was really no help for me. And, um, and even people I knew, friends and people from work etc they were quite negative about it they yeah. said look he's he's going to bleed you dry you've got to be tough you've got to you, you've got to really tell him he's got to uh, ship up or ship out yeah at the time i was really confused mm. I, I i kind of thought that maybe that was the way to go yep. but just totally abandoning him and saying something like you can't come back here until you're off drugs. Yeah. I, I really wasn't prepared to do that. Yep. Um, I was getting nowhere. The people who were supposed to support families weren't supporting me. The treatment services were giving me these messages, and even my friends and colleagues were saying the same thing. Yep. Um, yep. The person who, who was different was my daughter. Right. She, she was three, three years older than Damien. She just said, send him up to me. She was living in the Blue Mountains. She said, I'll, I'll detox him. And so I did. I packed him up on a train and off he went to the mountains. And nine days later, I get a call to say he's, he's detox, he's withdrawn. Huh. And yeah, I thought we'd won. I thought we'd beaten it. Yeah. Um, uh, but of course we hadn't. Yeah. Um, the, all that had happened really was that physically withdrawn yep. from the from the drug but he hadn't stopped thinking about it he hadn't stopped the emotions or but he did start using a lot of alcohol right um and so i wasn't really as much concerned about that as i had been about the heroin mm. but in reality it, it was terrible he was using so much uh, the next 12 months were an up and down sort of ride for him. He was fairly happy-go-lucky and um, he was doing a lot of positive things and he got a new girlfriend. But then what I discovered later, reading through his, his documents, he used to feel very black and bleak. And it was on you know one of these occasions, of course, that he died. And... That day, which was the 24th of February, 1997, and shot up for the last time at 10.15 that night. Mm. So he was taken to St. Vincent's, pronounced dead on arrival. And then we had a funeral to, to organise. Mm. And um, all the support we had and people saying positive things, you know, like I just felt uplifted by that. Um, but then, of course, it kind of dissipated. Everybody who knew him went back to their own lives, which is normal and expected, but that's when it really hit me. And mm -hmm. 
you know, the physical pain that you that you experience in that time immediately after, and for quite a long time, um, it, it really is awful, mm. is the only way to describe it. Um, and that goes on for quite a long time. Mm. And some days you'll wake up and you'll kind of feel reasonably normal. You won't think about it, but then in the middle of the day or sometime later, it will hit you again. Mm. And, and then it, it, it kind of compounds. And we've worked out some ways of assisting families through that. Yep. Um, one of the things we did with David was we bought a huge candle. And on those occasions, we light the candle and it's just a kind of acknowledgement. And a lot of families have, have done that same thing and find it helpful. But it doesn't take away the pain. Yeah. And it's now 24 years. Yep. So um, has the pain gone away? Well, the burning intensity of it has. Yeah. They say time heals and it doesn't heal, it changes. Yeah. Yeah. And you took an interesting path because with that searing pain and grief, you decided to work and support families and, and help people get the things that you didn't get. But your stance today, and it has been for a while, your stance is that you're a big supporter of safe injecting facilities, prescription heroin, and pill testing. These are considered quite small liberal positions. How did you arrive there? The first thing I suppose that changed my thinking on this was, and of course I was talking to uh, doctors and and uh, medical experts and they were saying that there's no need for people to die from overdose. Yep, They can be revived sometimes with oxygen. And if not, then there's no oxone and there's aware that we can revive them. Yeah. So as long as we are aware the overdose has occurred, we can we can bring them back. And so I thought, well, this is a pointless death. This is someone who's died who shouldn't have died. Mm. So that was one of the first things that started to make me think. Then of course it was the attitudes and um uh and I'd already realized that with the attitude of the police and the and the people at the mortuary and that that it didn't seem to count. Yep. You know, it was just another drug use. Yeah. There was that community attitude of if a, if somebody dies from drugs, it's their own fault. And yes. Uh, and society is maybe better off without them. Uh, it's it's a terrible thing, but that's what that's the way a lot of people think. So yeah. realizing that people thought that these people were criminals mm. and sinners in some churches. Mm. That was something I couldn't take either. Um, and by that time, I'd made contact with people like Dr. Alex Wardak and other people who were really pushing harm reduction in a different way. Yep. Uh, and so I became interested in that. Um, and one of the one of the one of the governments that was doing something progressive was the ACP government, and they'd put together a proposed trial mm. for prescribing heroin similar to what was happening in, in Switzerland and the Netherlands and other places. And so I became intrigued by that. Um, the ACT government actually got the uh, health and justice ministers of all the states and territories to agree to a trial. Mm. A day later, John Howard, the prime minister, canned it. Yes, I remember that day, actually. Yeah. It sends the wrong message. Yeah. But that was the end of it. Yeah. They made the decision and that was the end of it. So I was angry mm. about that. And then that followed up with the New South Wales government, who had had a, an inquiry into injecting facilities mm. and produced a very thick report, which was overwhelmingly in favour. Mm. But again, the government said, no, we, we can't do it. We're not going to do it. Because on top of my anger about the other things, I wrote a letter that night um, and I described my son as a junkie lying in a back alley. And then I described a funeral where 400 people uh, praised the, the young man that they really liked. And I said, this is the same person. It's not a statistic. And I went to see my local MP. He was, um, was happened to be the opposition leader in New South Wales at the time. and. He, um, he said, 
you know, give it, give it, give it up. Don't, don't pursue this. You, you're never going to get anywhere. No government's going to support these kind of things. Um, just go about your grieving and forget it. Mm. Well, that's like a red rag to a ball to me. Yep. So one of the people who called me was the Reverend Bill Cruz, yep. who runs the Ashfield uh, United Church, yep. the Exodus Foundation. He said, look, mate, he said, I've been advocating uh, uh, decriminalizing, legalizing drugs for 30 years. And uh, we've been told that if we did that, we'd the floodgates would open. He said, it's very stupid because the floodgates did open anyway. Absolutely. And he said, why don't we have a, pub why don't we have a public meeting? Mm. I said, fair enough. Well, I'll be in that. So we told all these people who were ringing in that this was going to happen. We held it on a, a night at his, um, his church. Uh, people like Jack Mundy came along and a lot of people who were you know, going to speak. But really... The families took over the meeting. Yeah. The story after story of people who were affected. Yeah. And at the end of it, there was so much energy and need in the room that we said we can't leave this. We asked the people who were interested to come to another meeting, and literally that's where family drug support started. And that that was the big springboard. We're losing four people a day in Australia, which is what we were at that time. Yep. Yeah. And we keep doing the same old things. Just as a final question, grief is painful and it's unpredictable and it brings up big feelings. How do you think we could better support people whose loved ones are significantly affected by drugs? Well, that's what we do. Yeah. And where we started was what I didn't get. Yep. So that phone call I made that didn't get the supportive response, said to me, what we need is a, is a line mm. that actually supports people. And, and that's what we've established. And we, we take about 25,000 calls a year now, yeah. our national number. And we don't tell people what to do. We don't give advice. We actually use a model called uh, motivational interviewing, where we get them to come up with their own solutions yep. and uh, and we just uh, non-judgmental and supportive and ask the right questions um and it works um yeah it doesn't it doesn't make people drug free but it allows the families to cope with what's going on we give them com communication tips and tips on staying safe and and harm reduction mm. and and the reason i mean we started off by saying uh, perhaps people would be surprised that I would advocate for the harm reduction stuff. Well, no parent I've ever spoken to likes the fact that their family members are using drugs. Yeah. Everyone would wish that they were off them. Yeah. And a lot of their motivation initially is to get them off. Yeah. But one thing I know that's more important than that even is that none of them want the person to die. Absolutely. And so that's, that's primarily where I come from in my advocacy for harm reduction. Tony, we'll, we'll leave it there. I'm personally really grateful for the work you've done. It's affected my life in a very big way. And for that, I thank you. And I think on behalf of many people, you've done a great job. So thank you so much. Thank you. And we've still got a long way to go though. If you or a loved one are affected by alcohol or other drugs, and you want to talk with someone, you can contact Family Drug Support 24 hours per day, 7 days a week on 1300 368 186. We have also listed a number of other organisations on our website that you could reach out to. Through the determination of people like Tony Trimmingham, Australia's first medically supervised injecting centre opened in Sydney in 2001 and there have been over 9,000 overdoses managed without a single fatality. Since then, Melbourne has opened one in 2017 and managed 271 overdoses in the first 18 months. Drugs can have a devastating impact on people's lives, but things do not have to remain this way. The evidence is irrefutable. The war on drugs hasn't worked 
and if we continue approaching drug use as a legal issue rather than a health issue, things will not improve. A different approach is possible. Thank you for tuning in to It's a Minefield. This program has been kindly funded by the Mental Health Commission of New South Wales and broadcast on community radio station 2 R in Sydney. Produced by Leon Fernandez, Caroline Savransky, Chris Jager, with executive producer Jeff Furillo. You can reach out to us on Instagram and Facebook with the handle It's a Minefield or get in touch via email info at iamf.org.au. See you on the flip side, June bugs.